Hey everybody, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. I want to get one more Survivor Series out of my system before the month is over. And with that, it's time to look at Survivor Series 2003 from November 16th at the American Airlines Center in Dallas, Texas. This show was nominated by Jacob Hogan and Craig Thibodeau over on Patreon.com slash Wrestling with Regret. It is the 17th Survivor Series in history and considered by many to be one of the best. And you know, considering Considering the last Survivor Series I reviewed was considered one of the best of the Attitude Era in 98, let's look at one of the best Survivor Series of the Ruthless Aggression Era in 2003. One reason I think that this show is so well remembered, just look at this set. It is so epic in how it encapsulates two of the biggest gimmick matches on the entire night. You've got the pile of dirt and the payload truck and the gravestone and everything on one side of the set for the Buried Alive match. And you have the ambulance on the other side for the ambulance match, not to mention everything else going on with the set with the big target and everything. This this is an iconic set to be sure. Something else equally iconic here is that dramatic way over the top opening hype package for this thing. It's all about survival. Who will survive? What shadows live in these dark men's souls? And talking about how evil and satanic Vincent Mann is. It's very reminiscent of the old like uh, 98, uh, early 99 pay-per-view hype packages that had like Freddie Blassie narrating them and everything with the biblical verses and whatnot. A really big throwback to that with this opening package. He is the face that decides the fate of all all men. Can the darkness of his soul be overcome? 13,487 people packed the American Airlines Center, 450,000 pay-per-view buys in all. That is the highest number since 99 with 448,000 and is the highest it would ever get again before the advent of the network. Michael Cole and Taz are your announced team for SmackDown, Jim Ross and the King for Raw. Your opening match is the first of two Survivor Series matches on the night as Team Angle takes on Team Lesnar. Team Angle, of course, is captained by Kurt. There's also Chris Benoit, Bradshaw with his JBL hair before the heel turn. Hardcore Holly back from neck surgery and is soon to be challenging Brock Lesnar for the championship at the Royal Rumble and John Cena. And at this point, you can really tell, this is around the time you can realize, just watching the product, okay, this is the guy the company is strapping the rocket to. The way they are building him up, especially in this particular matchup, is huge. They're giving him, like, as close to the Steve Austin treatment as you possibly could because, you know, he's still, like, a jerk in character, still has lots of sick burns in his raps and everything, but he does, you know, he is a He's a force for good overall in the grand scheme of things in the ring. They tried to muddy the waters and kind of confuse things about, well, who is he really, whose side is he really on or, you know, whose allegiance does he really have? At the end of the Go Home episode before this particular show, in fact, it's the moment where he hits the FU on his partner for Survivor Series, Chris Benoit, and he's supposed to walk off like, oh, he's a badass. He doesn't care whose side he's, he's fighting or whatever. But then they ended up actually cutting that bit from the final broadcast version of SmackDown because according to rumor and and legend, the moment where he hits Benoit with the FU didn't quite get over with the fans the way they were hoping to. And so they said, well, we don't like that reaction, and they just decided to scrap it entirely, and it was never brought up again. And on the other side of the ring, you have Team Lesnar, the champion, Brock Lesnar. You know, it was funny, a year ago at Survivor Series 2002, he turned face for the first time after Paul Heyman turned his back on him and helped Big Show win the championship. One year later, Survivor Series 03, that face turn has been completely thrown out. Brock is the champ once again, and is a heel once again again, although now he's without Paul Heyman, which makes it not quite as good. The winner of that match tonight will face me tonight. And yes, I will have my title on the line, on the line. Here Lesnar has built what's being called the largest group ever assembled for Survivor Series. And looking at these big boys, you know that's probably true. He's got the U.S. champion, The Big Show, A-Train, Matt Morgan, and Nathan Jones all in his corner. You know, a couple of these guys, Morgan and Jones, they couldn't work for shit. But at least, you know, on paper and just looking at the picture, these guys looked huge and intimidating. It was crazy. Nathan Jones is built like a brick shit house. This was one giant beefy team here. As McMahon would say, the beef is here. Cena opens the festivities with one of his raps good stuff here. He wants a one night stand with Sable among other things. Before the match, Holly jumps the gun and starts fighting Lesnar, but because it all happens before the bell rings, Holly is disqualified and is eliminated from the get-go. Easy payday for Bob Holly. Clothesline from Hell woman it later to A-Train, who's now taken out. Then right after that, a choke slam to Bradshaw. He's eliminated, and things slow down with Cena and Lesnar in the ring. Big ass press slam from Show to Benoit was really impressive. Angle with a big hot tag and suplexes the hell out of everybody. Angle slams to Matt Morgan, he's gone. Kurt outsmarts the big show, eliminates Nathan Jones. Then Lesnar comes in, hits the F5, and now Kurt, the captain, is eliminated. 
It's down to two on two. Benoit putting Lesnar in the cross face and making Lesnar tap out clean as a whistle, which is a huge deal because Benoit, you know, he was getting a lot of momentum. He wasn't at that point yet where he was challenging for the world title at WrestleMania 20, but he was definitely on the peripheral in like the top championship scene. So for him to beat Lesnar like that with a submission was a pretty huge deal because Lesnar, you know, didn't lose to too many people at this point in his career. You know, shades of what happens today, actually. Benoit would later challenge Lesnar for the championship uh, the following month on SmackDown. It's down to Big Show versus Cena and Benoit two on one. The writing's on the wall here. The match ends when the Big Show misses a blind tag, chokeslams Benoit, who he thinks is legal, but he turns around and eats a chain from John Cena while the referee's back is turned. F you to the Big Show to put him away. And this is actually the first time John Cena put the F you on Big Show. You know, it's funny because of my Mania 20 review, I erroneously said that that was the first time he did it, completely forgetting about this moment here. So my bad. Anyway, the match ends with Cena and Benoit standing tall, doing the fist bump afterward, show of respect. I give this one four stars out of five. It's a really strong opening to the show. I mean, the Survivor Series match itself is done really well. Really good pacing. You have the quick eliminations. You have some slow action as well. And really something for everybody in this particular matchup. And it ends with a very creative finish. So yeah, from, st from start to finish, from Cena's wrap to the end of the match, very great way to open the show. And as far as Nathan Jones goes, we will not see him in the company for very much longer after this match. I do vividly remember going to a house show in Portland about a week or two after Survivor Series, and there was a, a multi-man match that was very similar in style to this particular Survivor Series matchup, and Nathan Jones was involved in that. But yeah, not much longer. They would do a tour in Australia but a week or two later, and it was there in Australia that Nathan Jones decided, you know what? I'm just going to stay home. I'm going to stay here and just quit wrestling altogether. And he did. Backstage, Mr. McMahon approaches his son Shane. How about it, pal? The McMahon boys, each fighting a brother of destruction. Vince tries to appeal to his son's religious side. Shane says he just feels sorry for him. Then Vince, dejected, he walks down the hallway, walks right into his old nemesis, Steve Austin. They kind of do like, the mirror gag at first, and then they start both, both start laughing. Then Austin stops, and Vince is spooked, and that's pretty much that. <laughs> <laughs> One of the big feel-good stories in 2003 was Lita's return to in-ring action after her big neck injury she suffered the previous year while on the set of the Fox series Dark Angel. She had the surgery and the recovery, and she came back to great fanfare in September, and now she's gunning for the gold, going after Molly Holly and the Women's Championship. You know what? This match is really good, and it's between two very competent actual female competitors. It's not a TNA match. It's not a bikini contest or a lingerie pillow fight or whatever have you. It's just a legitimate wrestling contest with two of the best female workers in the company at that time. But, you know, and I know I'm going to sound like a broken record for saying this, Jerry Lawler really brings the thing down with his commentary because it's still very much in that late 90s kind of period where he's just talking about appearances, specifically Lita's going like, oh, hey, JR, remember when she had the thong that was exposed and everything? Like, that's all he talks about in this matchup when there's a perfectly good match going on. And again, I know I rail on Jerry Lawler a lot here, but, you know, it's still worth looking at and saying how badly this has aged and how far women have come, I think, in, in the company since uh, from, from, from 03 to now. Lita gets hucked over the top rope early on, but she makes her comeback with a big dive from the top rope. Lita then goes for the moonsault and eats all the shit. Molly go round by Holly. We get a big kick out from there. Molly then exposes the turnbuckle, drives Lita right into it, pins and wins. Pretty uh, abrupt finish there. I mean, in the sense that, you know, lately today, when you see the, the turnbuckle post getting exposed, it's a long time. A lot of walking around and working before that, that Chekhov's turnbuckle is finally utilized in the finish. Whereas I would call what Molly did here in this match kind of like video game logic, where, you know, in games, the SmackDown games, you could take down the turnbuckle pad and then immediately drive. That's the first thing you want to do is drive them into it. And often you're able to do that. So for Molly to do that right away, it's like, Boom, there goes the turnbuckle pad. Boom, here goes Lita into it. Very quick, very efficient by Molly here. Anyway, I give this one three stars out of five. Commentary by Lawler notwithstanding. Still a very well done match by two of arguably the best female workers in the company at that time. And not much else to say about it. Up next, the ambulance match as Kane takes on Shane McMahon. Now, if you're new to this era of wrestling and you're just watching this show for the first time and you want to have an idea of just how much gravity and emphasis they're putting on this particular storyline, all you need to know, all you need to do is watch the hype package for this match because it, for starters, has the most epic music in all of recorded history, O Fortuna. It's the dun, 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 dun. 
dun, 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 so dramatic, so over the top for what is really an over the top storyline. Back in June, Kane was unmasked after losing a match to Triple H. He then went insane, beating up everybody in sight, including Linda McMahon with a tombstone. This brought about the return of Shane McMahon, who wanted revenge for his mother, and things just get insanely violent between these two. Of all the different storylines you've got going on in this show, including, you know, a world championship feud between Triple H and Goldberg, this by far surpasses everything in terms of sheer insanity and the stunt work and everything they have involved with this. At one point, Shane throws Kane into a flaming dumpster. You've got a limo with Kane inside that's rigged to drive headfirst into a parked semi-truck, which results in a huge crash. You've got electrocuted testicles, hospitalization, a bloody beatdown on Shane in said hospital, and then Unforgiven in September, these two fought in a last man standing match. Kane would win after Shane went for it all and missed. And now here's the ambulance match, where the object of which is to get to throw your your opponent in the ambulance and close the doors in the back in order to win. And can we talk for a second about how dated this ambulance looks? It's like a wood interior in there. I don't know what's going on, but that ambulance is definitely not the ones you see driving around today. On commentary, JR describes Kane as crazy as an inbred pit bull at the start of the match. Shane dives onto Kane to start things off. They fall out over the top rope. Kane almost gets spiked on his head. Very scary look here. The weapons are brought out early. Shane does a diving elbow to the outside on the table right away. Just gets that spot out of the out of his system. Kane sits back up though. And here's the thing: this match at, on its own is portrayed very much in kind of like the finale of a slasher film. You know, if we want to use see no evil as comparison, it's you know Kane and Jacob Goodnight. He's still this indestructible monster, and now it's time for the scrappy, you know, mortal human to try and do what he can to outsmart and try and kill this monster once and for all. Uh, Shane leads Kane on a wild goose chase to the outside, the parking lot area. We lose the camera feed for a second in this pursuit, though. But yeah, Shane outsmarts Kane, whoops him with a kendo stick, and then backs a car into him. Then Shane produces a walkie-talkie out of nowhere and goes, send it, send it, summon the ambulance. Another ambulance backs up into the... The, uh, parking lot area. Shane tries to end it early, but Kane then wakes up. Camera cuts out again. We lose some of the feed. Back to the arena. Kane throws Shane into the windshield of the ambulance. It cracks on impact there. Very uh, brutal looking shot. Then Shane slams the door onto Kane's head. Shane with a great tornado DDT on the floor. Then Shane does a really creative thing here where he takes this big, big like uh, wooden box, wooden slash cardboard, but based on its consistency when he lands on it, hard to tell what it's made of. But he basically wedges it in between Kane's legs, puts a trash can in Kane's lap, and then does a variation of the coast-to-coast -coast jumping off the back of the ambulance and then onto the big box, which breaks his fall as he does the drop kick into the trash can. Very innovative stuff here. Very crazy spot here by Shane. Shane then almost shuts the doors, but Kane's able to pull him in. They fight out of it. Then Kane lawn darts Shane into the side of the ambulance, head first, a la Kevin Nash to Rey Mysterio in 1996. Uh, Kane choke slams him into the side. A tombstone on the floor. Kane then shoves him into the ambulance and shuts it for the win. So now between that and Unforgiven, Kane is 2-0 and on Shane in these crazy-ass stipulation matches. I give this one four stars out of five. In terms of spe a pure spectacle, this match is great. You know, like I said, it's the story of, you know, like the serial killer, the monster versus the human, and how is the, how, how is, how is the non-serial killer going to survive here against this monster? You know, I think it hid Shane's weaknesses in the ring fairly well, because it's a pure brawl. That's where he really excels at. They have to beat the hell out of each other in some very unique ways. You know, but I still maintain, I said this way back in my top eight worst Kane storyline countdown, and I will say it again in 2019. This storyline really did Kane dirty. Because as fun as it was, and as crazy as it was to see these wild stunts these two would do to each other, this one-upsmanship, it still to me made Kane look really weak. The fact that he was selling so much for and making so competitive this non-wrestler in Shane McMahon, who yeah, he's a McMahon and he can fight and do those crazy stunts. Stunts. But still, when you're against this guy who's just been running roughshod over the entire roster, for Shane to be the one to be putting up the most fight against him, uh, that never sat well with me. And like watching this match again, as fun as it is, I still think it's like that, you know, it's mm, it's hard for me. As, as big a Canaanite as I am, it really broke my heart to see this angle once again play out before me as I watched this show. I mean, it was great for Shane's career, though. Made him look like a million bucks and really helped build his mythology for years to come, even all the way up until today, like all the way back from his, his comeback at WrestleMania 32 against The Undertaker to his wars with Roman Reigns and Kevin Owens in 20 freaking 19. Like he's still billed as this like in this, this really tough fighter. And The Miz too, let's not forget at WrestleMania. He was like all over the place here in 2019.
screen. And I think a lot of his character that we know today comes from this particular storyline against Kane, where these two just beat the shit out of each other. And Shane, despite going 0-2 against him at pay-per-views, still came out like, you know, still on his own two feet, still able to fight another day. So, yeah, great for Shane. Not so good for Kane, and I still maintain that. Backstage, Josh Matthews interviews Brock Lesnar and asks how it felt to lose tonight. Brock takes offense to that, saying he didn't really lose. He was just eliminated in part of a larger match and says that still he can beat anyone single-handedly. In walks the world champion Goldberg, champion and champion in the same place at the same time. Goldberg acting a little bit smug, kind of joking with Lesnar, asking if he's going to wish him good luck in his match later on. So then after Goldberg leaves and Brock looks proper miffed, it seems like this is the moment that sets off in motion their entire storyline going into Mania 20, and then, by extension, their renewed rivalry a few years ago around Survivor Series and WrestleMania in Orlando. And uh, there you have it. This is what began all that. Back at ringside, the coach emerges with a night brace. He got beaten up by the Dudleys last week, so he's selling it still. Coach says he will make a full recovery, so thank God for that. He sees the Dallas Mavericks owner, Mark Cuban, sitting at ringside. We then get an impromptu interview with Cuban. A coach asks, what are you looking forward to tonight? And Mark goes, I want to see Austin kick Bischoff's ass. He then takes a shot at referees in general, which gets a big pop from the crowd. Eric Bischoff, the GM, then shows up and tells Cuban to say it to his face, so Cuban gets in the ring. Eric says that, you know, you may own the building, Mark, but I'm renting the building tonight, so it's my building. Eric shoves Mark, and then Cuban pushes back, and Bischoff sells for him huge there. Out comes Randy Orton, who hits an RKO out of nowhere on Cuban, and what a bump by Cuban, too. I mean, Bischoff sold for Mark, and then Mark gave it right back to Orton, a great sell. Probably one of the better wrestler, non-match non sells by a celebrity in quite some time. He took that right down, the right flat. Very good bump by Mark Cuban there. And then uh, JR going, where's David Stern when you need? him. He was then the NBA commissioner if you don't have the context of that. So that's the, pretty much that whole segment there. I mean, it's it's not much to say about the overall quality of the show. I think it was a great way to break the ice, uh, break the tension, keep things going after the Wild Ambulance match. And, you know, still keeps people energized because Mark Cuban is this big public figure in Dallas. And to see him eat the RKO is a pretty big moment. Then after we cut backstage to Evolution's locker room, Triple H is going to have sex with all these ladies here tonight. Uh, but Flair warns him not to lose his man juice just yet. There's a toast. Orton runs in and shares his good deed. A good little boy Orton is. Evil fun time for Evolution in their base. WWE tag team title match up next. Those are the tag belts for SmackDown, by the way. As the Basham brothers, who are accompanied by Shaniqua, remember her, take on Los Guerreros, Eddie and Chavo. Eddie's been a bit of a rut as of late. In the span of one week, he lost the U.S. Championship to the Big Show at No Mercy, followed by the tag team titles with he and Chavo less than a week later. So he's been a, he's been a bit of a rut, and he wants to Really redeem himself here in this matchup. Shaniqua, Linda Miles, she was one of the winners of Tough Enough in one of its first years and has been regarded by pretty much everyone involved in the company as one of the worst personalities to have backstage. She didn't last very long, but she did manage the Bashams to at least one championship reign on SmackDown. She does get a shot in on Eddie here on the outside for the cutoff, so she makes herself useful here in this matchup. The Bashams working over both Guerreros here. I love Eddie's comeback here. I love where he does the double arm drag head scissors combo with the Bashams. Twin Magic by Doug and Danny is thwarted. Chavo takes down Shaniqua, and Eddie hits her with a frog splash. That makes now, between Mayhem 99 and Survivor Series 03, two classic reviews I've done almost back-to-back -back that involve Eddie Guerrero hitting the frog splash on a muscular female wrestler. A crazy coincidence, that is. But then Chavo accidentally takes Eddie down while doing a Tornado DDT. We get a roll-up by one of the Bashams. They grab the tights. The Bashams win and retain. I give it two and a half stars out of five. It's a good enough match, but compared to everything else going on uh, in terms of like action and excitement and intrigue going on with this show. One of the least significant things about the entire evening, but it does do a very good job building up more of the tension between Eddie and Chavo. Not too long after this, Chavo would betray Eddie and turn heel, so Eddie would then be solidified as a big babyface single star. They would have a blow-off match at the Royal Rumble, and then, of course, that would lead right into Eddie's quest for the championship at No Way Out, and you'd know the rest of that story. In your second Survivor Series matchup, you've got Team Steve Austin versus Team Eric Bischoff with some major implications. I'll get to that in a minute, but first let's talk about the teams themselves. On Team Bish, you have Chris Jericho, Mark Henry, Christian, Scott Steiner, and Randy Orton. Meanwhile, on Team Steve, you have Booker T, the Dudley Boys, who are the World Tag Champs on Raw, Intercontinental Champion RVD, and Shawn Michaels. And you know, looking at the makeup of this matchup here, at times I felt like I was transported into a match at Impact three or four years into the future. Anyway, 
way, after WrestleMania 19, when Austin lost The Rock, Eric Bischoff fired Austin as a wrestler. It was just a good way to write him off of TV since that was his legitimate, his last match in wrestling. So then shortly afterward, Linda McMahon would rehire Austin as the co-GM, basically to make Eric's life a living hell. The dynamic between Bischoff and Austin was an interesting one around this time. Of course, you know, going back to the beginning of the year after Austin and Bischoff had a match, it was Austin's big return at No Way Out. And of course, that stems from the personal animosity they had in real life going all the way back to WCW. So they have this real personal history here and it plays off in here where Austin and Bischoff are constantly, you know, butting heads over, you know, administrative decisions and whatnot, matchmaking decisions, causing a lot of the heels on Raw to favor Bischoff and resent Austin. I think even at one point Christian and Jericho are picketing on Raw because they're protesting Austin's tyrannical reign as co-GM. And so a condition of Austin's employment at this point is he's not allowed to be beating up wrestlers basically at will like he used to when he was a wrestler because he is in a, a, he's, he's in a position of power essentially so the big conditions of this match are if Austin's team wins he's able to beat up all the wrestlers willy-nilly if he wants to but if Bischoff's team wins then Austin is fired not just as co-GM as a wrestler he is gone and that's one of the big things that they're going can you just imagine like what a tragic world we'd live in if Steve Austin were fired you know the birds wouldn't sing anymore the sun wouldn't shine it'd be a dark black day in professional wrestling if Steve Austin were fired. The match begins. Steiner works over RVD early on, suplexing him hither and yon. Booker tees a house of fire until a low blow stops him in his tracks. Scott gets the Steiner recliner locked in, and Stacy Keebler, who is his valet at this point, she gets on the apron to cheer him on for some reason. In the confusion, a reverse 3D by the Dudleys, slammed by Mark Henry. Booker's gone. A 3D and a five-star splash onto Henry, and now he's gone. So it's very similar to the last Survivor Series matchup. You get these boom, 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 really quick eliminations, uh, punctuating in between these longer spans of no eliminations. RVD is hot for a while until Jericho pushes him off the top rope. He rebounds into an RKO. Don't worry, he'd sell a lot better in the IC title match they'd have later on. RVD is eliminated. Christian with another distraction, which allows Jericho to eliminate Devon. A low blow by Jericho to Bubba, an unprettier by Christian, and Bubba's gone. It's suddenly down to three on one. Christian, Orton, and Jericho versus HBK, and the heels have gotten away with murder all match. Let's see how they continue doing it. HBK bleeding profusely at this point, Christian mocking him with the trademark pose, but a sweet chin music out of nowhere allows Christian to be eliminated. Somehow Michaels is able to survive all this despite just bleeding buckets. It's a really gross cut, but he would be outdone in the next match. We'll get to him in a little bit. Anyway, he counters a Walls of Jericho attempt into a roll-up and it pins Jericho, so it's down to one-on-one, -on -one, Michaels and Orton, but before anything can happen though, Jericho smacks HBK in the face of the chair, then leaves. Orton crawls on top. HBK somehow kicks out. Orton doing his old cross body off the top rope, but there's a reason he doesn't do it anymore. You can see here as he takes the ref down instead. Sean goes for another kick, but Bischoff stops him with a karate kick of his own. Austin gets in the ring, beats up Eric, then hits the stunner on Orton, and a great sell by Randy here. Batista of Evolution runs in, hits a Batista bomb on Shawn Michaels. Orton falls onto him once again. The referee slowly counts the three, and that's it. Team Bischoff wins. Randy Orton with another great statistic for a Survivor Series record, and Steve Steve Austin is out of the company. I'm gonna give this one five stars out of five. It is like the perfect Survivor Series matchup, just in terms of the format and what they do with the eliminations and the pacing. And then there's the overall storytelling they have here from beginning to end and the valiant comeback by Shawn Michaels. The three on one deficit he tries to overcome, bleeding profusely, you think he's down for the count. Ultimately, it takes outside interference to make Shawn look really strong in defeat. Just a great way they did this whole thing. And the story overall with Austin's job on the line was also made it that much sweeter. But yeah, overall, Great matchup here, fantastic stuff. After the match, a disappointed Austin's got a touching moment with HBK, then gets to have a speech. It's basically the speech, the farewell speech he didn't really get to have in Seattle earlier in the year, because outside of himself and The Rock and Vince and JR, no one really knew that was Austin's last match. So in this way, he's able to finally get that kind of proper you know, closure and farewell. He wasn't really granted at WrestleMania 19. He talks about how his career began in 1989 in Dallas, Texas, so it's only fitting it ends there in Dallas, Texas. As so he thanks the fans and everything, then the coach shows back up singing the Hey Hey Goodbye song with some workers dressed as cops. Austin beats all the cops up. So he's basically committing a felony multiple times over, unless of course they're like rent to cops. They don't have the same kind of power as regular cops. It is a very long, drawn out farewell, but it is appropriate given the stature of Steve Austin's character and everything he's done for the company and whatnot for him to end it in Dallas. Very fitting here. It was, you know, technically the end of Austin's run 
as a full-time character in the sense that, you know, Austin was still, like, treated as a wrestler, a viable contender for championships. Even though the last couple of years were marked by a lot of, like, breaks in his full-time schedule, whether it be the injury or the walkout he had the previous year, that sort of thing. Like, he was really still treated as kind of like, it's Steve Austin, the, the, the man here in the company, essentially. But this was the end of his run as a full-time character. But, of course, far from the last time we'd see him, he would even come back before the end of the year at Tribute to the Troops. He would then also show up as the guest referee for the Lesnar-Goldberg match at Mania 20, then show up a year later for Piper's Pit at Mania 21, and so on and so forth. In what is unbelievably your semi-main event, yes, there is one match after this, folks. It's a buried alive match as Mr. McMahon takes on The Undertaker in what on paper is a can't-win situation for the evil chairman. So yeah, Vince has had it out for Taker for months at this point. Uh, Taker wants to become a champion again, and Vince says, as long as I'm breathing, you will never become champion again. So Taker just goes, okay, I guess he's going to stop breathing then. Like, damn, the shit gets really serious. In the build of this, Vince gets very biblical. He says he has a higher power in his corner. It's very interesting how this kind of holier-than-thou God complex thing he's got going really predates his angle with Shawn Michaels uh, and God by a couple of years. Also, at one point, Vince threatens to have Taker's wife Sarah raped, which, yikes, uh, the Attitude Era is still alive and well in 2003. Terrorists are going to burn down the Undertaker's house. His children are going to be kidnapped. His wife, she's going to be raped by a motorcycle gang. Before the match, we get a pair of these full screen graphics that highlight Taz's keys to victory, an absolutely useless, pointless segment here. I mean, I've never liked, you know, the color commentator's keys to victory in a wrestling match before. To me, it's always kind of hokey, but it's especially bad in this match where, like, clearly that shouldn't matter. It's like, it's a wild stipulation match, buried alive. You know, put the keys to victory aside. The match begins, Vince has his hands clasped in prayer and Taker throws the soup bones coal and Vince is bleeding right away like a stuck pig. It's super gross. You thought Shawn Michaels bleeding was bad. This is you know, 10 times worse. Multiple crotch shots into the post, some table fighting. Taker whomps Vince in the face with the shovel. There's no give there. Taker carries a lifeless Vince to the grave. Sipe of Vince starts fighting back there. Taker ultimately stops him after a very brief moment of shine. But it explodes in his face. Big explosion. What's going on? It's Kane. He emerges and beats up his brother. As he then he throws him into the open grave site. Vince gets in the loader and his iconic shot. Kane does the American badass fist in the air pose, all the dirt right into the gravesite, and Taker loses. Vince somehow defies the odds and survives another day. I give this one three stars out of five. Again, uh, what a spectacle this whole thing was. A bit more one-sided than the ambulance match, but if we're going to compare, you know, a McMahon versus Brother of Destruction match to another one, I would say that the ambulance match was better because, you know, as much as I hate the fact that Shane, you know, was so strong against Kane, at least he got to do stuff and like kept things interesting and competitive as opposed to this one and of course having the the cheap ending also it factors into that as well but yeah great story here being told even though it was not as technically as good of a match i guess you could say as the ambulance matchup of course uh, after this kane would explain why he did what he did he he turned his back on the undertaker because you know oh he 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 listened to the people basically he was oh you became a good guy you listen to the fans and i hate you for it now so it is a whole eulogy for taker on smackdown but of course, it's not the end. It's only the beginning. It sets up this long build leading up to Taker's eventual return from rehabbing all his injuries, coming back with a kind of a different spin on his classic dead man gimmick at WrestleMania 20, reuniting with Paul Bear against Kane one more time. If you want to see how I thought about that match, go check out my review of WrestleMania 20. So after all the craziness of Team Austin versus Team Bishop and the Buried Alive match, guess what, folks? We still have a main event on our hands. It's for the World Championship, but this one really fails to live up to the hype, which is ironic because the entire crux of the storyline is about the champion living up to his hype. It's Goldberg defending against Triple H. Back at Unforgiven the previous month, Goldberg finally beat Triple H for the world title. A day late and a dollar short should have happened at SummerSlam that year. Triple H then puts a $100,000 bounty on Goldberg's head, very reminiscent to when Harley raced to the same thing to Ric Flair in 1983, building up their Starcade matchup. After weeks of attempts from others and failing, finally Batista claims the bounty, yet Goldberg would come back in the title rematch later on, so I don't know if the job was officially done. Does the actual reward still stand? Anyway, Goldberg is still selling the leg injury he suffered to, to write him off for that bounty storyline. Triple H still saying Goldberg's all hype, which makes him sound really dumb considering he lost to Goldberg while he was still saying that. In fact, that was what begat the Believe the Hype show. 
shirt that, that Goldberg had for a while during this run. The match doesn't officially begin until after some fighting between Goldberg, Triple H, and Flair in the ring. Goldberg starts out strong, but his ankle gives out at him mid-press slam. Triple H attacking the leg with a chair, and Flair follows up. Even calls Goldberg the son of a whore. Simply in a vile, uncaring way. On the outside, Flair stomping on the leg. Goldberg is just awkwardly laying still under the ring partway through. It's not a good look for Goldberg here. This match goes a very long time, which does not play into his strengths. And I'll talk about that more after this match is over. But yeah, Goldberg, you know, these longer matches really expose Goldberg in a major way. A figure four attempt is powered out and Hebner goes down. Flair hands Triple H brass knuckles and Triple H decks Goldberg right in the head. We get a pinfall and a kick out, but Goldberg kicks out way too late. If you go by the cadence, it should have been a three count and Goldberg fucked up. So but Hebner had to do what he had to do. And then Triple H hits a big fuck you elbow to Hebner in response. Triple H grabs a sledgehammer and then after Goldberg fights it off, Ric Flair runs in. He gets tossed off the top rope. Goldberg grabs a sledgy, hits Flair, hits Batista, hits Orton. We get a pedigree attempt blocked by Goldberg. Bill grabs the hammer once again. Looks like he's going to go for a kill shot on Triple H, but he decides he'll, he'll beat him in the man's way. He throws the hammer down. Spear, jackhammer, Goldberg decisively retains against Triple H to end the show. It is the weakest of all the matches on tonight, which is sad because it is the main event. It is the world championship match. But of all the different storylines, this one probably has like the weakest build to it. You know, it's like, I think the finish of this was very on brand for Goldberg. Like that was a really strong way to end the match. But again, the length of the match, like that was what really did Goldberg in, in his first run of the company was they kept trying to put him in these WWE style matches that are very long and have more of a story. And they didn't play to his strengths. When they brought him back years later for the feud with Lesnar and Kevin Owens and all that stuff very recently, they finally figured out what to do with him. Just have him do what he did in WCW that made him so successful. But this was a really, you know, not a great run for Goldberg. Like I said, he won the championship later than he probably should have. They didn't strike when the iron was hot. And then the final insult happens one month after this at Armageddon in a triple threat match for the title. Goldberg defends against Triple H and Kane and Triple H wins the title back. Womp womp. But yeah, just not a great look for Goldberg around this time. I think the length of matches he was in really was a, was a big factor in that. My final grade for Survivor Series 2003 is an A-. It is a damn near perfect Survivor Series. I mean, just a great list of entertaining matches with some crazy stipulations involved throughout the whole thing. There are a couple of matches that don't really do it for me, but they're not even that bad of matches. They just kind of like pale in comparison to their wild shit that goes on in this show. I think both the Survivor Series matches were really, really well done, especially Team Austin versus Team Bischoff. Holly versus Lee was a was a very good match. Uh, the Buried Alive match was crazy. The Ambulance match was crazier. Uh, just a lot of wild stuff going on here in this show. And uh, what, another thing that makes this, ma this show so strong is that it does such a good job planting all these seeds for what happens in the next big shows. Not just the Royal Rumble, but WrestleMania 20 as well. Uh, yeah, what can I say? But, you know, People say this is one of the best Survivor Series of all time. And after watching this show once again for the first time in a long time, I absolutely agree with them. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of Survivor Series 2003. If you want to play a role in determining which shows I look at, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate classic shows for me to review. And next time on this segment in two weeks, um, what the heck, TNA Victory Road 2011. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. The winner of that match tonight will face me tonight. And yes, I will have my title on the line, on the line, to prove to you people that I am the greatest champion in history.